Let us thank you for, Lord, this new day. Thank you for the sunshine, the breath of life. I ask your blessing over the worship as we draw near to you. Lord, prepare hearts to receive from you in the teaching of the word. In Jesus' name. Now I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. I just want to be where you are, dwelling daily in your presence, and I don't want to worship from afar, draw me near to where you are, and I just want to be where you are, in your dwelling place forever. Take me to the place where you are And I just want to be with you I want to be where you are Dwelling in your presence Feasting at your table Surrounded by your glory In your presence That's where I always want to be I just want to be, I just want to be with you, and I just want to be where you are, to 
Went up boldly in your presence And I don't want to worship from afar Draw me near to where you are And oh my God You are my strength and my song And when I'm in your presence The one with you are always strong I just want to be where you are Dwelling daily in your presence And I don't want to worship from afar Draw me into where you are And I just want to be where you are In your dwelling place forever the place where you are and I just want to be with you and I just want to be I just want to be with you Lord of heaven, I do not deserve the grace that you have given and the promise of your word. Lord, I stand in wonder of the sacrifice you made. in us make your love just without bounds in our hearts Lord 
Lord, your spirit upon us, Lord, increase our capacity to love, to love others, to love you, to love others. Increase, Lord, just our, our hearts. Expand our hearts, Lord. hearts to you right now, Lord. We ask that you would minister to each one, each one that's tuned into the live stream, each one that's here. May you speak to the depths of our heart. May this be a time where we just don't learn from you, Lord, with our heads, but also that we would be changed in our hearts through the work of the Holy Spirit. May you anoint our time together in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me pray. Ask the Lord to bless the time in God's word. Luke chapter 11, verses 1 through 28. Well, I just want to thank you for, Lord, your, your faithfulness. Thank you for the, um, for the sunshine this morning. Thank you for the, the life that you give us each and every day, the breath of life. So many things that you bless us with, a place to worship, a Bible to read, fellowship, Lord. You yeah, just provide it all, and uh, we just don't want to ever forget that. We want to be mindful of your blessings. And so I just pray now that as we open up your word, that you have a specific word for each one of us, that you would baptize us in your spirit to receive all that you have in your message this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. 
All right, as mentioned, Luke chapter 11, you open your Bibles up to Luke chapter 11. We're going to begin reading right at verse 1, and I, I'm going to cover all the way to verse 28. It's so a lot of verses, and I kind of pondered, well, maybe I should just start writing to the parts. But, you know, it really is important, I think, to read through the whole. You're going to see why as it transitions from prayer to deliverance, okay? You think those have a lot to do with each other? Yeah. And so we're going to read through the whole and then look at the parts, okay? So let's all stand as we read the Word of God together. Luke chapter 11, right at verse 1, we'll begin reading. <clears throat> Luke chapter 11, verse 1 says, Now it came to pass, as he was praying in a certain place, when he sees that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. So he said to them, When you pray, say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day by day, Give us day by day, excuse me, our daily bread and forgive us our sins for we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Verse 5, and he said to them, which of you shall have a friend and go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has come to me on his journey and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within and say, do not trouble me. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give to you. Verse 8, I say to you, though he will not rise and give to him because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence he will rise and give him as many as he needs. Verse 9, so I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. Verse 10, for everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. If a son asks <clears throat> for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? Verse 13, if you then, being evil, know how to give good foods to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Verse 14. And he was casting out a demon, and it was mute. So it was when the demon had gone out that the mute spoke, and the multitudes marveled. But some of them said, He casts out demons by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. Others, testing him, verse 16, sought from him a sign from heaven. But he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and a house divided against a house falls. Verse 18, If Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? Because you say, I cast out demons by Beelzebub, and if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But if I cast out demons with the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man fully armed guards his own palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he comes upon him and overcomes him, he takes from him all his armor in which he trusted and divides, the, divides his spoils. Verse 23, he who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters. Verse 24. And so when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest. And finding none, he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it swept clean, put in order, and put in order. And then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Verse 27. And it happened as he spoke these sayings that a certain woman from the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast which nursed you. But he said, More than that, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Well, I just want to lift up these scriptures to you. Such a wealth of scripture, such great, great direction in your teaching. Help us to receive it. Help us to understand it. 
and help us to walk in it. I ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. All right, you can be seated. So we just read a lot of verses. But if we take a step back and begin to outline the passage this morning, you know, we can probably segment the parts this way. Let me just pose this to you. The first part is on prayer, obviously, in verses 1 through 13. And the second part is on deliverance, obviously, in verses 14 through 28. So I don't know if you've ever done that. As you read a passage, before you start to dissect it, you kind of outline it. Because it usually is a flow. And anybody that writes anything, usually there's a flow. And so you want to take the, the whole and then look at the parts. And so you can see the, the flow here by looking at the, um, the macroscopic view. It's prayer and deliverance. Now, think about this. Prayer and deliverance, do you think there's any connection in the two? Well, I say yes, absolutely. Prayer is the key to deliverance. And so you can see the connection in this flow from one to another. Prayer is the battle to deliverance. And so about half of the verses we're going to cover this morning in the parts is on prayer. And the other half is on deliverance. And it's right down about the middle, if you look at it. But you know, you're only going to notice that by taking a step back and reading the whole before you begin to dissect the parts. By doing that, we can now observe how the two, they really work together. Prayer and deliverance. And that connection in prayer and deliverance is really the battle. Prayer is the battle for deliverance. And I think of what Paul described in his letter to the Ephesian church. Perhaps you know where I'm going. At the end of that letter, he signed off that letter with this. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. You can turn there. I'm going to read this to you. But this is how he signs off the letter. <clears throat> Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Here's the key. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. So I want you to notice this. It's not praying sometimes. It's not praying most of the times even. It's praying what? Always. Always. Paul exhorts them with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints to be praying always. You know, this is good old-fashioned intercessory prayer, isn't it? Paul is exhorting this church to enter in the spiritual battle. And that spiritual battle is done with prayer. All the before is just preparation. The breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the spirit. They are preparatory armor for the battle. But what's the battle? The battle is prayer. Praying always notice with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end, with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. See, we must, all of us, persevere in this spiritual battle, which means we must persevere in prayer. And notice, praying always. 
with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. And so we're to pray without ceasing. Now, let me ask you, how do you do that? How do you pray without ceasing? Anybody drive a car? You can close your eyes, bow your head while you're driving the car. It says to pray without ceasing, we think. That's not what he's talking about. And I don't think Paul is exaggerating here. You know, sometimes people do that. They exaggerate to make a point. I don't think Paul is exaggerating. I think you can pray without ceasing. And that's the exact prayer he's talking about for intercession. Praying without ceasing. Well, we can actually live our lives of faith here on this earth with praying always. It is a 24 by 7 God consciousness whereby we are always listening and always conversing with our Lord. While we are not always kneeling down with our eyes closed, we can be praying always as the Spirit leads us in our every day and every hour and every moment in life. It's a God consciousness. When you're driving, you can be hearing from the Lord. You can have some worship songs on. You can be praying while you're driving. It's what I call to God consciousness, always listening to the Spirit's voice and always talking to the Lord in the Spirit. It is a continuous God consciousness of prayer, of communication with the Lord. Do you think the Lord's always with you? Well, Scripture says He is. Think Scripture is lying? I don't think so. Is the Lord always listening to you? Why, well, I think He is. That's what Scripture says. He never slumbers. Even in the wee hours of the night, He can speak to you. You can speak to Him. And so in that way, I do believe that we can be in prayer without ceasing, which is really the kind of prayer that Paul is describing here. He says to pray always, because that's a spiritual battle. And so back to our outline of Luke chapter 11, which we just read, there's that prayer described in verses 1 through 13, and then the deliverance thereafter. Described in verses 14 through 28. And you can see the connection between the two. Hopefully you can. You can. As you take a step back and connect the dots. Prayer precedes deliverance. And so let's begin looking at the parts. This is the section on prayer. Verse 1 says, Now it came to pass as he was praying in a certain place. When he sees that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. As John also taught, this would be John the Baptist, as John also taught his disciples. Now, notice they asked him about prayer when he ceased praying. So obviously they were either observing his prayer or they were praying with him as a group. Now if the latter, I'm not sure which is which, maybe they're just watching in prayer, but if it's kind of they're praying together, if the latter, could you imagine praying together with Jesus? <laughs> Can you imagine us thinking about that? And I kind of think that that's what was happening, which invoked their question, Lord, teach us to pray. They heard the Lord pray and says, hey, man, I got to learn how to pray like that. But also notice the inquiry that they had. I want you to notice this. It was, Lord, teach us to pray, not Lord, teach us how to pray. You notice that? Lord, teach us to pray. And you know, it's interesting to know, because even though Jesus follows by giving them an example of prayer, they are actually asking, Lord, teach us to pray. And it probably is an even better question than asking how to pray, when you think about it, because the to pray precedes the how to pray. And I think that many of us probably are in the former camp. Lord, teach us to pray. You have to be praying before you can exercise how to pray. You understand my point? That would be a question for you and I to ask ourselves. Lord, teach me to pray. Because I don't pray much. 
I do not even enter into the spiritual battle much. And so I think we can all probably begin with that inquiry. Lord, teach me to pray. Before we ask him, Lord, teach me how to pray. This is from David Guzik's commentary. He wrote, the, he wrote this. Most directly noticed their request was not to learn how to pray, but to pray. Our greatest difficulty is not with mastering a specific technique or approach in prayer. Our greatest need is simply to pray and to pray more and more. I like that. You know why I like that? Because I think it's true. I don't know about you, but it's true for me. Lord, teach me to pray more and more. Help me to enter the battle more and more. And I think we can be praying always as Paul exhorted the Ephesian church. But the reality for many of us is that we are praying little. Lord, teach me to pray. Get me into this battle. Because it's a battle for souls. Mm -hmm. Teach me to pray. Verse 2. And so he said to them, when you pray, say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day by day. Give us day by day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And so, notice Jesus responds by giving them kind of a model prayer, when you think about it. An example of how to pray. Now, I think that this is a powerful prayer that can be said verbatim. And oftentimes, we do say this verbatim in churches. But I think more so, it's an example of how to pray. It's a model prayer, if you will. Therefore, I want you to notice in this example the order. It starts with what? Praise, doesn't it? Praising our Heavenly Father. How many start with petition? Lord, I need this. I'm in trouble. Help me. And, you know, the Lord knows. But if this is an example for prayer, notice how it starts. It starts with praising your Heavenly Father. I mean, maybe if you have children, you kind of can understand. You may have a child. Maybe it's not mature. Dad, Mom, I need this. <laughs> it's like, they never get to, you know what? I love you, Dad. I love you, Mom. No, I need this. And I need it yesterday. Can you imagine doing that to our Heavenly Father? Well, this is really the model prayer. He's saying that, you know, be thankful that your Heavenly Father loves you and does provide for you. Our, our Father in Heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is, it is, as it is in Heaven. It is good to start our prayers with praising God being thankful, because it gets our focus off of us and onto God. And that's a good thing. It gives us a proper perspective as we go into petitions. And then notice the after. After praising God, then follows the petitions. Notice. Then in verse 3, give us this, give us day by day our daily bread. And then verse 4, and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now, without getting overly detailed into this model prayer, I want you to take a step back and notice the flow once again. The flow is praise and thanksgiving, then petition. And then with this example, you can begin to fill in your own personal petitions. But I would really encourage you to start off with praising and thanking your Lord, because it's going to change your entire perspective. And so it's not so much saying this prayer verbatim, but it presents us a model, an example of prayer that brings blessing. Begin praising your Heavenly Father 
and then move to your personal petitions and intercession. But always begin with praise to get that proper perspective on your petitions. Now, in the following section, there's an emphasis now in persistent prayer. I want you to notice. Notice in verse 5. And he said to them, Which of you shall have a friend? And go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has come to me on his journey. And I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within and say, Do not trouble me. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give to you. See, the application here is that when it seems like it's a little bit too late to ask the Lord for something, or it seems like he's not answering, or he's not listening, then that is when you need to not lose heart and be persistent. Notice that. Because obviously God is always listening, but sometimes he doesn't answer in the way that we think he should or in the time that we think he should. But we should continue to be consistent and persistent in our prayers. And oftentimes it is in the time frame of our persistency that we're changed, that we're transformed. Because when you think about it, prayer should not be about getting our will done, but whose will? God's will done. And so often, I start my prayers with a wrong heart. I want. But by beginning with praise and thanksgiving, oftentimes, I start to hear what God wants. And so persistent prayer has that wonderful benefit of transformation. And perhaps there's a function, I don't know this, but I'm just throwing this out. The function of your prayers not being answered is a function of the transfer, transformation that he's doing within you in that prayer time, perhaps. Verse 8, I say to you, though he will not rise and give to him because he is his friend, yet because of his, what, persistence, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. And I think that God oftentimes waits for persistent prayer before he answers. Not all the time, but I think oftentimes he does. Our persistence doesn't change God, but it changes us. And that's a good thing. It develops in us godly desires. Oftentimes when we begin, and we've been praying for over years and years, when we begin that prayer, our heart was wrong. But then as he begins to unfold his answer, he has changed our heart. And oftentimes that happens through the time of persistent prayers. Verse 9. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks it will be opened. So keep on asking. Keep on seeking. Keep on knocking. Be persistent in your prayers. And in due time, it will be given to you. In due time, you will find what you are seeking. And in due time, the doors will be open. Maybe not like how you thought when you started praying, but this is his promise. So don't be surprised if those doors at the end of that persistent prayer time is different different doors than when you started. Persistent prayer, I believe, is a key ingredient for change. Mm -hmm. You've been seeking the Lord. That's right where the Lord wants you. And the Lord seeks to change you. And oftentimes, he does that through persistent prayer time. Verse 11, if a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? 
Verse 12, or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, and when he says evil, he's not saying you're just a, you know, he's saying if you then, not being God, God is good, we're not good. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And so, firstly, we need not be ashamed of asking, notice. We need to keep asking, keep seeking, and keep knocking. Because our Heavenly Father loves to hear your prayers and petitions. And our Heavenly Father loves to provide for His children what they need. Maybe not what they want. Can you imagine if you gave your children everything they wanted? That's not good, is it? But as a parent, you want to give them everything that they need. And that's our Heavenly Father. But notice here in verse 13, Jesus highlights your greatest need, doesn't he? I want you to notice this. Often we overlook this. Do you see what it is? It's in verse 13. It's the Holy Spirit. How much more will your Heavenly Father give you the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? This is oftentimes overlooked. But I believe it highlights what we really ought to be asking for in prayer. You know what I ask for? Get me out of this situation, Lord. Get me this new job. Get me this. Get me that. What does Jesus underscore? You should be asking for more of the Holy Spirit. More of God's Spirit. The great thing that we can be asking for in prayer is the baptism of the Spirit notice. Mm -hmm. How many of you, that's your highest and greatest prayer? Lord, give me more of you. Baptize me in your Spirit. That's exactly what Jesus is saying here. And that is exactly what our Heavenly Father knows that we need. And therefore, that is what we should be asking. Foremost in our prayers of petition, Lord, Give me more of you. Give me more of your spirit. And he's going to do it. Notice it's not a car. It's not a home. It's not a husband. It's not a wife. It's not children. What is it? It's the filling of the Holy Spirit. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more? What he's saying is, my Heavenly Father's going to give you more than any father here on this earth. How much more will your Father, Heavenly Father, give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? So what's the inference here? To me, the inference is, we ought to be asking for more of the Holy Spirit. Is that not what it's inferring? And He's going to be faithful to do it. And He does it because He knows that that's what we ultimately need. Isn't that interesting? Now, the second part of our outline, deliverance. But remember, the lead into this deliverance is what? Well, we just read prayer. Praying always. Praying without ceasing. Now, verse 14. It says, and he was casting out a demon. And it was mute. So it was when the demon had gone out that the mute spoke and the multitudes marveled. But some of them said he cast out demons by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. Now, I want you to notice this before we go on. Notice that not only are these religious leaders denying Jesus, they're going one step further and claiming that by the prince of demons, he casts out demons. And this, as we're going to see in chapter 12 a little bit later, maybe uh, two weeks from now, this approaches the unpardonable sin the blaspheme of the Holy Spirit, which we'll get into when we get to Luke chapter 12. But here they are approaching that unpardonable sin right here. They are attesting the work of the Holy Spirit to Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. It's going to be an interesting thing to, to observe. Verse 16, Others testing him sought from him a sign from heaven. But he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and a house divided against the house falls. 
verse 18. If Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? Because you say, I cast out demons by Beelzebub. And so notice the logic he uses here. If Jesus were controlled by Satan to cast out Satan, then Satan is working against himself and against his own kingdom. So what's going to happen? Satan's kingdom is going to fall. It really is another lesson in Logic 101. A kingdom will not stand if it battles against itself. But then he asks, what about your deliverance ministers? The ones that you use, you scribes and Pharisees. Verse 20 says, and if I cast out demons with the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. That is, you need to make a decision on me because the kingdom of God has come upon you by the revelation of the stronger. You cannot remain neutral because the stronger has cast out the weaker. Notice in verse 21, it says, when a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are in peace. Until when? A stronger comes. Verse 22, but when a stronger than, than he comes upon him and overcomes him, he takes from him all his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoils. And so that's Jesus. That's the strength that Jesus displayed right here, the stronger when he cast out the weaker, which was that mute demon. Mm -hmm. And therefore, he's saying there is now an accountability to what you just saw, that revelation. And he's saying you can no longer remain neutral. No longer can we stand behind the excuse of neutrality when it comes to Jesus. Because with Jesus, there is no neutral. You're either for him or you're against him. Because the stronger has revealed himself and made himself known to you. Neutral is not an option. It really is a weak excuse that it's not going to stand in the day of judgment. You're going to stand before Jesus in that day and say, you know, I was neutral. Can I get in? You're either for him or against him. And these are the very words of Jesus. Verse 24, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest. And finding none, he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it swept and put in order. Verse 26, then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. So once the weaker is cast out, notice, cast out by the stronger, he must ask the stronger to remain. That is, ask the stronger to be the Lord of your life. Otherwise, what's going to happen? That spiritual void in you, when that unclean spirit came in, that spiritual void in you is going to be filled with seven more even more powerful. Notice it says that unclean spirit goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself and they enter and dwell there and the last state is worse than the first. And it happened, verse 27, as he spoke these words that a certain woman came uh, from uh, the crowd, raised her voice, excuse me, and said to him, blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast which nursed you. Verse 28, but he said, more than that, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Now, I want you to notice the emphasis here. It's emphasis on his words, isn't it? Even more so than his life. Notice that? Blessed is the womb that bore you, the woman said, and the breasts which nursed you. But what did he say? More than that. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. The point he's making is that God's word is what sustains and strengthens in this life of faith. Those who hear the word of God and keep it, they're going to be blessed. Do we not have that liberty today? 
to receive that blessing, to hear the word, and to keep the word. See, we have more today than even these ones that saw Jesus walk this earth. And so it begins with prayer. Praying always. Prayer without ceasing. That's the kind of prayer that does battle. And we have to enter into that battle by interceding. And so like these disciples, we have to ask the Lord, Lord, teach us to pray. Don't worry about how to pray. Just pray. The spiritual battle is won in prayer. And so you can find a lot of people going to Bible school, learning all these things, sword of the spirit, shield of faith, all these armor, all the armor for battle, but then they never get into the battle. What's the battle? Prayer. You've heard me say this before, it's like that football player. It's all padded up, never gets in the game. Doesn't make sense, does it? The battle is prayer. And as we win that battle, there's deliverance. The two go hand in hand. And so once we're delivered from the darkness to the light, we now have to sustain ourselves by the word of God. And that's the blessing, remaining and being cultivated in the light through the receiving of God's word. And so we go from darkness to light. There's deliverance. Prayer and intercession gives us that, especially as we pray for those that don't know the Lord. But once they come to know the light, once we come to know the light, there's now that sustaining. And that's through the word of God. And so that's the kind of flow that we see in these scriptures. Prayer, intercessory prayer, praying without ceasing, deliverance. And as people are delivered, then what? The sustaining, the teaching of the word of God. That's the fullness of the package. Prayer, being saved and delivered, and then growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord through the teaching of the word. That's the full package. It's a powerful one. And it's one that we ought to be exercising here in this church on all the different levels. We ought to see people begin be getting saved. And prayer is the fuel for that. But as they're saved, we ought to see them growing in the Lord through the teaching of the word. Pray, Lord, we thank you for your word this morning. Help us, I pray, to be a fellowship that is moving in all these, these ways. A house of prayer, interceding, that ones in the darkness might come to the light. And when that happens, that we would be a place that teaches the word of God so as they come to the light, they would remain in the light. And that they would grow in the grace and knowledge of you. Impart these, these things in this fellowship. And I pray, Lord, just you would remove those things that impede these, these wonderful works, prayer, deliverance, and then growing in the grace and knowledge of you. Anything that would impede those things, Lord, I pray that you would remove, that you'd cut it off. Oh Lord, we desire to be a church yes. that is planted and that is surrounded by these things. Prayer, deliverance, and growing in the grace and knowledge of you. 
I ask these things in your precious name. Amen.